to our international uh, inverse problem seminar. Uh, we are very happy today to have uh, Lexing Ying from Stanford, which will be talking about solving inverse problems with uh, with deep learning. Thank, thanks a lot, Lexing. Okay, uh, thank you, Knut. Uh, yeah, uh, today I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, some recent work on trying to solve inverse problems with deep learning. So um, I first want to claim that I'm not an inverse problem person, so I only I learned inverse problems a bit from books written by many people here and also by interaction uh, with some of the people in the audience. And um, but so the talk is really trying to uh, see whether we can use deep learning to solve some of the uh, interesting problems, uh, help solving some of the inverse problems. So this is a joint work with uh, two of my previous postdoc, uh, Yu Wei Fan and uh, Yu Hao Guo. So Yu Wei is with uh, Huawei Hong Kong now and uh, Yu Hao is an assistant professor in Chicago, at Chicago University of Chicago. And uh, finally, it's also joint work with my uh, student, Cindy, who's uh, graduating this year. Okay, so, so inverse problem is, uh, I guess, I mean, this slide is really prepared for other, um, uh, other, other, other um, talks, but for this one at the inverse problem seminar, I think everyone familiar with that. So inverse problem in some sense is really trying to discover internal structure. Uh, from boundary measurement. So I, on, the, on, the, on the top of the slide, I give three pictures, uh, radar imaging, uh, where essentially use electromagnetic wave to uh, try to discover objects far away and their shape and potentially their material. And the second picture is about seismic imaging where you have the ocean survey. So the, um, the equation used here is more like uh, sometimes acoustic, sometimes uh, elastic equation, where you're trying to find out what is the internal structure of the earth. And uh, finally, the last picture is about medical imaging. And uh, so in this special case, it's, uh, it's, it's uh, the physics behind it is uh, electrical impedance tomography, where you put some kind of uh, voltages profile around a kid's chest. And then by, uh, by recording the, uh, the current, uh, and you're trying to figure out, uh, one can try to figure out whether anything is, everything is normal inside, okay? So the goal of this uh, of the inverse problem in some sense is trying to, well, I mean, there are many goals, but one of the mathematical goal is to try to figure out what is this inverse map. So the inverse map is a map from the boundary measurement data, which I denoted by D, uh, to the internal parameter, which in, in most of the talk, I, most of the slides I would denote by eta. Okay. So this is a quite challenging problem because as we all know, sometimes it's the problem is ill-conditioned especially for the last example, this EIT example, right? And so therefore, sometimes you need the regularization uh, either from the model or from the data. And um, if you take a look at this inverse map itself, it, it's, it's also, um, even though the equation used here sometimes are uh, uh, linear equations, but because we're really trying to figure out the material property, uh, which meaning the coefficient of this equation. So this inverse map itself, uh, which, which from the measurement, boundary measurement D to the internal parameter eta is, is, is really, it's a high dimensional nonlinear function, okay? So trying to represent this function uh, could be quite challenging. So, um, well, I mean, the tool that we're gonna use in this talk is, is uh, in this project is uh, deep learning. And by now, I mean, I think deep learning is, uh, is everyone's familiar with deep learning. Um, so, I mean, for, from a mathematical point of view, the most important thing about deep learning is this uh, deep neural network. And, and the way I view it is, is, is that it's a very flexible, representation for high dimensional functions and also high dimensional probabilities. Okay, so uh, probability distributions. So it, it allows you to do, I mean, using the machine learning terminologies, it, it allows you also to do uh, automatic feature extractions. And uh, there's also quite effective stochastic algorithms like a stochastic greedy descent. And also there's very simple, um, back propagation algorithm, very powerful, but very simple. It's really based on the chain rule, which allows you to calculate the gradient with uh, respect to the parameters of your model very effectively. Okay, so these are, these, these are the things really coming together to make the deep neural network very powerful. And, and also uh, with, with the effort coming from a lot of, not only academia and also industry, especially industry in this case, uh, you have very powerful softwares like, uh, like a PyTorch, and also TensorFlow. And you also have hardware like GPUs, TPUs, which really make uh, deep learning very effective, and even a large data set. 
So the goal of this uh, project is to, to is is to combine is to uh, apply deep learning to inverse problems, and we're trying to essentially trying to represent the inverse map, which is a map from the data boundary measurement to the internal parameter eta with the neural network. And we're trying to uh, include include both the physics of the problem and also some training data together, and try to see whether we can represent this inverse map approximately. So the main challenging of uh, main challenges of the uh, of using deep learning for inverse problem come from two. Um, I see two main challenges. The first is that for inverse problem, the amount of data we have is usually quite limited. Uh, and this is a very different situation coming uh, compared with all these AI problems. In, uh, from CS, for example, uh, where, for example, in image classification or in translation, in uh, there, I mean, the data size, the training data size is in the millions of tens of millions or even hundreds of millions. But, but for inverse problem, typically the data size is relatively limited. Um, part of the reason is because gathering data is more expensive because you have to do physical experiments, right? Seismic surveys, or you have to measure to some kind of uh, uh, measurement on the patient and the other is for legal reasons because uh, it's very hard to imagine that oil and gas companies willing to put all their data together for, for, for us to do research and also it's, it's you know, for hospitals it's also very hard to imagine that two hospital systems will combine their data together I mean because they have to get consent from the patients and there are a lot of legal issues so the data is limited. And the second challenge is that often when you're solving a regression problem, then uh, we're solving a classification problem. So the regression problem, uh, not only you want to say yes or no, you also want to say whether this bad number is five or 10 or whether it's less than one. Or, so you need a little bit more effort to figure out the solution. So the plan of uh, our approach is to try to really try to combine mathematics and physics behind inverse problems and um, use, it, use them to design new neural network modules. So I'll give you two examples. One example is for the so-called pseudo differential operator. The other is called Fourier integral operator. So these are really operators up here quite often in inverse problems. And then the overall strategy is to really take a look at the inverse map and, uh, and try to assemble a neural network to approximate this inverse map. Okay, so, so and, and the, but, but on the other hand, I only did this, this, and this, at this step, I only decide the architecture of the neural network. And finally, all the weights of the neural network are trained end to end to use our limited amount of data. So I want to make a claim that, I mean, here we're not in this so-called, uh, for those of you who are familiar with deep learning theory, so we're not in this over parameterization regime. So all our models are actually quite simple. The number of uh, parameters is actually not that large. So therefore, um, uh, so we were typically training only a model with like a, a tens of thousands or maybe a hundred thousand parameters rather than millions or billions of parameters. Now the main advantage I believe of our approach is that we, we somehow combine the mathematics and the physics behind the inverse problem theory with the, uh, the data we have. So in some sense, we can not only use, a, use the theory, uh, inverse problem theory, um, but on the other hand, we can also cleverly, I mean, I mean in an effective way leverage the data prior. And this, this, this is in some sense, uh, the main advantage of this approach. Okay. So I will talk about a few applications um, to showcase that, I mean, this approach actually works quite well, simple cases. So three examples of far field imaging, uh, electric impedance tomography and travel time tomography. Okay. So the rest of the talk is outlined as follows. So we're gonna talk about these new modules and uh, then after we talk about these new modules, uh, I'm gonna go to applications. So new modules. Uh, okay, so uh, if you take a look at recent development, not so recent by now, is in the past 10 years or so, what are the recent de uh, the developments of a neural network? Uh, if you take a look at the most successful neural network architectures or modules, they all have some connection with uh, well-known mathematical operators or theories. So for example, if you take a look at fully connected neural network, which is showing this picture here, it's really um, representing a dense operator. If you take a look at the convolution neural network, which is in this picture, it's really implementing a, a general, quite general a local translation variant operator, which is our convolution, right? Now there's also a network called the re recurrent neural network. This R stands for recurrent. So this picture is right here. 
I think some sense this is doing is that it's trying to model general Markov chain with a certain number of states, depending on how complex the network is. So it's really, it's, it's a Markov chain. And finally, the, uh, this ResNet, it's called residual neural network. So it's given by this picture here. So you can see that uh, it, it's really, it's kind of like a feed forward neural network. But on the other hand, it has this bypassing edges, which is really added the input to the output at every step. Okay, so this is really doing, uh, in some sense, this is doing OD integration. Okay, so so the mathematical object behind it is the uh, operator is a semi group. So all these neural network has mathematical nice mathematical structure behind it. I mean, in some sense, it's not surprising because all these mathematical objects are defined to capture all these important phenomena that we have seen in daily life. So neural networks try to mimic that. So now the, the, the question we ask ourselves is that, I mean, in this problem, we also see some interesting operators, which sometimes more complicated or more specialized than the operators up here. So two of them are pseudo differential operator and full integral operator. So the question we ask ourselves is that, well, what would be the architecture corresponding to these operators? Okay, so if we can design some nice architecture for, for these operators, then we can use these operators as a black box in, in our uh, PDEs and inverse problems. Okay, so the, the talk is, I mean, I, I think when I prepared the talk, it's, it's, I, it was not for uh, an audience as technical as this. So it's more like a colloquium a general talk. So therefore I apologize that many of the things I define are not precise. Uh, so uh, the pseudo differential operators, well, we all know that, I mean, this audience will know that the pseudo differential operator is defined this way. Uh, it's, uh, it's, you can either write it in terms of a kernel K or you can write it in terms of some kind of uh, Fourier multipliers, AX, symbols AXC, okay. <laughs> and then, uh, so it's a it's a really generalization of the differential operator and the convolution operator. And uh, in the in the case of the inverse inverse problems, so for example, in many uh, inverse PDEs, so if you take a look at the normal operator, so you take a look at the operator a star a, and uh, this is a in you know, the sort of suitable condition, this is a often modified a pseudo differential operator. So. And um, the, 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 so, so the goal here is trying to find a neural network module, neural network architecture, which can capture most of the pseudo differential operator that we see, okay? So, so in other words, we're trying to represent the pseudo differential operator in a sparse and a compact way as a neural network, okay? So the pseudo differential operator is a linear operator. So therefore this will be a linear neural network, meaning that you will not have all these nonlinear activation functions but we can also try to generalize its representation power by adding nonlinearities, okay? So here is, you have a mathematical theory behind it. Here I'll put a question mark because this is really pure generalization, okay? There's not much theory because we're stepping out of the linear uh, differential, op pseudo differential operator regime. But nevertheless, in practice, and this is a useful thing to do, okay? So how do we uh, represent pseudo differential operator uh, in a compact way as a neural network? Well, there are essentially, uh, well, the essential idea that's different ways to do it, but the idea is more or less similar. I mean, based on one principle, is that if you take a look at pseudo differential operator, right? Now, let's suppose we discretize it with a finite difference or whatever, uh, like a, with a Cartesian grid, and then you can try to you can try to write down this operator as a matrix, right? Because it becomes finite dimensional matrix. Now, for most of the pseudo differential operator, they all share the property that if you take a look at off diagonal blocks of these matrices, meaning that you take a look at the two part of the domain which are sufficiently well separated, and these off diagonal blocks are low rank, okay? And this structure is also repeated hierarchically, okay? So this is the idea behind a lot of work like the fast multiple methods, hierarchical matrices, and, uh, and which, which are powerful tools for numerical analysis to, uh, to, to, to handle, uh, to, to, to work with pseudo differential operators. So this is the idea that we're gonna leverage here. So more specifically, we're gonna, uh, using this wavelet transformation and also this non-standard form, which I will show you next slide. Okay, so this is, as I said, we're gonna use wavelet and the so-called non-standard form. So this is a work which is about, developed about 30 years ago by, uh, by, by Greg Belkin, uh, Rafi Kaufman, and uh, Vladimir Rachlin at Yale. 
I think by now it's exactly 30 years. I think the paper has appeared in 1991. I could be wrong. But, uh, but the idea is that, is that, that it's trying to represent a pseudo differential operator. Uh, but here I draw it as a matrix, which is a gray matrix, as a product of three operators. So the last operator is a wavelet transform. But this wavelet, so it's, you can say it's a wavelet decomposition operator. But this wavelet decomposition operator is a slightly different from the usual wavelet transform. So the usual wavelet transform, the way we familiar that is orthogonal transformation, or at least it's a square transformation, right? It's a, it's, 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 it's a non-degenerate matrix. But here, this transform is what we call a non-standard transformation. So it's trying to represent the signal not only as the wavelet coefficients, but also keep the so-called scaling coefficients at all the level. Okay. So in some sense, if you put up apply a vector here, and once you multiply the last matrix to this vector, what you get is a vector which is twice as long. So therefore, this represents the so-called wavelet frame rather than the wavelet basis. Now, this operator is really the adjoint of the last operator. So therefore, it's trying to represent this so-called, if this pseudo differential operator, it's, it's, let's say it's asymmetric. So therefore, you're trying to represent this symmetric matrix in your random frame. So the good thing about this work by um, Kaufman, Rockling, uh, Belkin, Kaufman, and Rockling is that when, even though that you increase the size of the matrix by a factor of two, because you keep wavelet and also scaling coefficients, but the middle matrix under this representation, this redundant representation is actually extremely, extremely sparse. So you can say that the operator naturally decomposes into different scales. So this is the finest scales. This is the coarsest scales. At every scales, you only have interaction within one scale and you don't have interaction across the scales. So fine is only work with fine. Coarse scales only work with the coarse. These are all diagonal block. And within every scale, the matrix really look like a block. It's, it's within, for example, the fine scale, it becomes a two by two block matrix. It corresponding to the interaction between the scaling and wavelet function. So this is a wavelet, this is scaling, this is a wavelet, this is scaling at the interaction at, <clears throat> at this scale. So that's why two by two. And within every tiny block, let's say for example, this one, this is just purely almost diagonal matrix, typically the band of this matrix three, okay? So once we have this picture, we can think about what if we apply this, uh, we do, what if we would multiply back? We apply this matrix to this vector. Yeah, uh, well, because it has this scale decomposition, so we can think about what happens at each scale. So at the finest scale, which I draw here, is corresponding to multiply, let me just draw, uh, let me highlight this matrix, is taking this matrix, multiply this matrix, and with this matrix, and to multiply with a column vector, okay? That's what happens at the finest scale. So you can see that if you're familiar with the neural network, you can see that this actually action can actually be written as a three layer uh, linear neural network where every layer is implemented by a convolution operator. Okay, so, uh, so here's a, in the first step, for example, right here. So you're taking vector, you apply this uh, banded matrix, which is two bands, right? This one, this one. But this will correspond to two convolution operators, or actually one convolution operator, but with two output channels. Okay, so uh, the, the rest of these two extra tiny, a small matrix multiplication will do the same thing. Each of them will contribute to one convolution layer. So at the end, you will have a three layer neural network, linear neural network to represent action at the one single scale. Now, this is just one single scale. And then if you repeat all the scales, you will get this picture. So this first line is exactly what I just showed you, right, for the final scale. But then this is the action for the next scale and this is action for the next scale, so on and so forth. And uh, there's this pass here, which is corresponding to the, you're going from one scale, the fine scale of the wavelet to the core scale of wavelet. So this dot here is really representing the wavelet transformation. Okay, no, sorry, this is upscaling uh, and the down, down, upsampling, downsampling stuff. Okay. Now, uh, as I said, I mean, this gives you a linear neural network, but you can also make it nonlinear by inserting uh, ralus, and then this is, by just naively inserting some right rules, you'll get a general structure, which is what we're gonna use. So we call this network a BCR, stand for Belkin, Kaufman, Rockling, and just to indicate that this is really a network that's inspired by, by their work 20, 30 years ago. Okay. So this is how we represent the pseudo differential operator. 
So uh, we can also try to represent the Fourier integral operator uh, in a smart way. So this is how we typically write on the Fourier integral operator. So uh, as you see that sometimes, I mean, the, the more general definition of the Fourier integral operator is that F will have a hat, it's a Fourier transform, and then you apply these, uh, these, 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 these symbols and also phase uh, to get the result. But here, let me just adopt the notation that we're only working with F. So you can think about this is the, this is the non-trivial part of the Fourier integral operator, with the, which only talk about the, the part which after you do the initial Fourier transform. So Fourier integral operator is uh, very powerful. It, it describes the wave propagation in uh, certainly in constant media, but also in variable media. And uh, it, it, it moves the singularity in a well-defined way. It's it, it follow the Hamiltonian flow, uh, which associated with a wave equation. So, so how do we uh, represent the neural network? Uh, have a neural network representation for for integral operators. So, so again, the idea is very simple: is that we're trying to take a look at the existing uh, work on numerical analysis for for integral operators to see whether we can find a sparse and compact representation for that. So, the tool we're going to use is this observation, which which we have is called a complemented row like this. But more precisely, what I, you know, a simple version is what I will gonna show you in the next slide is, is regarding this so-called square root size blocks. So if you take a full integral operator, again, we end by n full integral operator. Again, we discretize this. Okay, we describe discretize this operator. And then you get, uh, you, uh, or the full integral operator, you get by n points, you get n by n uh, matrix. Now the whole Fourier integral operator matrix itself is no, not low rank, okay? It's full rank because Fourier transform is a special case of this. So it is a full rank operator. And, and, and also that uh, the, the, the off diagonal low rank is usually not true. So for example, if you take a look at this big off diagonal low rank block, it's not uh, this block, it's not low rank in the Fourier integral operator case. But what is true is the following, is that if you partition this n by n block, in the matrix into square root of n by square root of n blocks, where each block itself is like square root of n. So you have square root of n blocks, right? If each block is a size square root of n. And then each of these blocks, that is numerical low rank. So what I'm showing here is that by doing some kind of like SVD or low rank approximation for each of these small blocks, each of the small blocks can be written as tall skinny matrix times a tiny block times a fat matrix, okay? So this second picture is trying to show that every block is being low rank rised, being, being approximated by low rank approximation. Now, once you have this, okay, so um, this, this, this is good, but, but it's not very friendly in terms of the neural network approximation. So what we can actually do is that we can rewrite this into the product of three matrices. So, so, so what, I, what we're doing here is very simple is that for the first matrix, you, you see all these columns here. These actually correspond to these columns in the first row. And uh, these columns here, I use a slightly different color corresponding columns, columns here. And now what happened to this row here? I'm using green here, I hope you can see this. The green, maybe green is bad. Let me use a slightly different color. Let me see what kind of choices do I have. Maybe uh, this, okay? If I take a look at this row here, these actually correspond to these rows, okay? So what I'm doing is I'm, I'm really doing some, it's, it's fairly straightforward, but essentially I'm reorganizing and repacking, repackaging these uh, different components of low rank approximation. And, and these uh, small matrices at every low rank approximation will go to its corresponding places, okay? In the middle. So it's not difficult to check that uh, this is actually an identity. Okay, so you can write my low rank, my blockwise low rank approximation into the product of three matrices. Now, one thing I want to comment is that this, in fact, is in some sense similar to what you see earlier uh, for the wavelet. This can be represented by a convolution operator. This can also be represented by a convolution operator. And the middle matrix actually, even though the pattern looks actually a little bit strange, but what happens is that you, know, you will see that if, for example, if you write down the middle matrix, uh, if I have block I and index J, okay, then the only non-zero entry is at, for the, for, the, for the column index is for the row index block I and the, and the within block, let's say index J, 
and the only non-zero entries at a block where the column index is block J and the row uh, the within the block index I. Okay. So in some sense, if you write the index, uh, the row and the column as a double index for the middle matrix, let me write M. The M, the only non-zero entry is Mij and Mji. That's only non-zero entry. Every all, all the other entries is going to be zero. So you see that this is what really this doing is that is this really doing a transpose of these two subcoordinates? So the block index become the in block index, and in block index become the block index. So this is really a transpose. Okay. So maybe I'm going too much into the detail, but the idea I want to convince you that this is not so hard. So therefore, we apply this operator into a vector. As I said, it becomes three things. One is doing this convolution. And then the second step is doing this block index switch, but that is really doing a transpose of my operator, transpose of my data, a modular sum like a pointwise multiplication. And the last step is also convolution, or maybe local convolution. So, so, so what happens here is that all these uh, full integral operator in this approximation can also be represented very compactly with a neural network with only three steps. So again, this. This is for linear neural network. And if you want to work with nonlinear objects, uh, nonlinear operators, you can add a few extra layers. You can add the ReLU. And uh, again, as I said, there's no theory here. It's just we're generalizing this architecture, hoping that this will be more powerful. OK. So this is the, what I want to say about the, the modules. And then I'm going to move on to the applications. OK. So we're going to talk about three applications. One is five field imaging, and electron impedance tomography, and the final one is travel time tomography. So, so each one of them, uh, the workflow is as follows. So we're going to design the neural net. Uh, so the goal is to design the neural network architecture. Sorry, architecture for the inverse map. So our motivation is actually very simple and naive. Is that we're going to try to use a perturbation theory and also filter by the projection. These are probably the oldest ideas in solving inverse problems. So I want to uh, not. I want to say that my. I want to argue that perturbation theory, even though it's very simple, but but it sometimes could be very powerful, right? So uh, it really comes down to where do you, does one to do the perturbation. So if you can have a pretty good initial guess, and then doing perturbation theory can actually give you pretty reasonable result in many applications. So so I want to use analogies. So. So for example, if you, many of you know about theoretical physics, so, so if you think about what the renormalization theory in quantum mechanics, quantum field theory, it's, it's the, the, and I mean, to a big extent, this is really trying to find the correct point where you to do the perturbation expansion so that you can draw these Feynman diagram and add them together, right? So once you choose the correct expansion point, then this give you meaningful physical predictions. But if you find the wrong point, you get a bunch of infinities and it's not very useful. So, so here we're trying to do the same. We're trying to really hoping that I, I, the word I'm using is hope is or I hypothesis is that the neural network can from the data to figure out what would be the reasonable point to perform the linearization. And then once this point is, is, is obtained, then the rest is, is the, the remaining is just to do the standard perturbation theory and feedback projection. Okay, I'll make this more precise in a second. Now, and uh, for, for this neural network architecture, the components we're going to use are actually quite simple. Is this BCR net I talk about for pseudo differential operator, and this switch net, this transpose thing I talk about for FIOs, and then finally we use a convolution. Okay, we only use these three things. Once we have the neural network architecture, then what we do is that we train the neural network with uh, uh, the work with the weights of the neural network. So the architecture designed by these. Uh, mathematical considerations, but the weights of the neural network are actually fully trained from scratch by using the data we have, okay? And once, once these two steps are done and uh, we can use our neural network for prediction. So whenever you give me a new uh, boundary data, I can try to use, put, it, put it through the neural network and the neural network will spit out what will be the interior material property. So, so I won't mention that uh, there's a, a lot of work uh, uh, using deep learning to to address some of the problems in inverse problems. So this this is the list that I uh, that I 
this is a list that I uh, gathered about, well, I mean, maybe quite some time ago. So, so this list is certainly not complete. So, so I apologize to to anyone whose whose work which is working on this area, but I uh, but I forgot to mention. But what I'm trying to say that's really the work is growing, okay? Because it's deep learning, uh, deep neural network, which is a powerful tool to represent a nonlinear function. That seems to be uh, quite natural to it's quite natural to use it to to represent inverse map. So the first uh, application is uh, the far field imaging. So this is joint work with my uh, Yuhao my previous po uh, postdoc. So so the idea here is that the problem is simple: is that you have a domain omega. So within omega, you have an unknown uh, parameter eta. So the, in fact, the, the physics is described by this uh, Hamilton equation, where the unknown is a cx, is unknown sound speed. But assume that there's some kind of like a background velocity, uh, like one. Okay, so we're talking about the sound propagation in, in air. So let's say that there's a uniform, roughly uniform background velocity, and uh, then uh, trying to figure out this unknown cx is exactly the same as figure out this unknown eta, which is which is kind of like the perturbation of the slowness. Okay. And here you see I scale everything by omega because omega for me is fixed, so it's a constant. Even though the omega could be a pretty high frequency, but it's a constant in this discussion. So, so the problem is that we we have a domain, we have the eta inside. It essentially decides my Hamilton equation, and what I'm trying to do is trying to figure out eta using boundary measurement. So, so what are the boundary measurement? Well, the boundary measurement are done as a follows: is that in the experiments we're going to sending a plane wave in this s direction, okay? So then when this, the wave hit this object, if there's no obstacles, the wave is just gonna penetrate, it's gonna go, go out. But if it does have obstacles, right, this E does. So it's gonna start scattering at a different direction. Here R, R prime, R double prime, okay? So for every outgoing direction R, what we're gonna do is that we're gonna record this quantity, which is the scattered field in this direction at a distance rho, which is far away. So rho is a scalar which is a distance far away, go to infinity. And then, but the signal is gonna get weaker, weaker, right? But we're gonna compensate this and uh, modulate this. So we're gonna multiply by square root of rho and modulate it by uh, the e to the minus i omega rho, okay? So if you do that, and this become a well-defined constant at the rho goes to infinity, and this is a well-known so-called far field pattern, radar imaging. So, uh, so our data really is this 2D array, so that for every incoming direction S and for every outgoing direction R, so this U, S, rho, or infinity R, this far field pattern is my data. And the inverse problem is trying to, uh, using this far field pattern and try to figure out what is my material property. Okay, that's what we do. Now, let's, before I propose neural network architecture, so let's just think about it. I mean, uh, I mean let's do a bit of analysis to see what, what do we get. So, so in fact, uh, before, instead of considering the inverse map, let's just consider the linearized forward map. So inverse map, inverse map is from my data to my material property eta, right? But so therefore the, the forward map is from eta to my data. So let's just try to see what is the linearized forward map. Well, after doing a half page calculation or maybe a one page calculation, one can see that this is actually up to certain constant or smooth factors is given by this integral on the right hand side. So this is the linear integral. It's an integral in terms of the eta. Okay. So where R and S belongs to S1 cross S1. Okay, we're considering 2D problems. So therefore the, the unit direction of down circle. So so therefore this A, but if it inspect this a little bit, this operator A here, this A which is going from D to eta. It's actually an FIO with an FIO going from this omega domain to this S1 by S1 domain, okay? This is not hard to show because what we need to do is just take a look at the restriction of this kernel onto the small chunk of the domain by doing this square root of n by square root of n partition, okay? And then we can show that it's low rank. So therefore this is an FIO. So if it's an FIO, we decide to use the switch net. So this, uh, this neural network that I introduced involving the transpose, right, to, to represent this operator A. Now, A star is also in the file, so therefore we can also use a switch net to represent it. Right? But in some sense, it's, it's, it's kind of trivial because the network that I introduced earlier like this, it's really symmetric 
So you can also reverse the order. So that will give you, this will give you operator A, this will give you operator A star. So therefore this switch net can also be used to represent A star. Now, so the design of the actual neural network architecture for the inverse map is really coming from this consideration of the, the filter back, uh, filter back, back projection. So it's really just saying that if, if uh, okay, sorry, what happened? Okay. Uh, hmm. Why did this appear? Sorry about that. Let me see. Okay. Okay. So what, what this really says is that uh, I'm doing pseudo inverse, regularize the pseudo inverse, and, uh, and then I will go from D to eta. Okay. Now, uh, if you take a look at this uh, formula, we know A star, as I said, is an FIO. And what is this operator? Well, this is the inverse of the regularized version of the normal operator. And then the suitable conditions that this is a pseudo differential operator. So therefore we're gonna to try to use this BCR net to, to, to so this is pseudo differential, but we're gonna use BCR net to represent that. So therefore now the architecture become clear. We take our data. What we do is that we use a switch net to implement this FIO, A star. And then we use a BCR net to implement the pseudo differential operator, which is A star A plus epsilon I inverse. And then once we do this, these two steps uh, is spit out eta. So I want to say that this is really motivated by the <clears throat> linear regime. And we just uh, take a leap of faith and, uh, and then say that let's make these network architectures more rich by inserting nonlinear operators and then try to represent the full nonlinear map using them, okay? So this obviously has the limitations, but I want to show that in, in, in some of the examples we tried, this actually gives a fairly decent result. And part of the reason is that the neural network can try to capture the data prior and, uh, and the learns where to do the linearization. Okay. Now, so here I'm gonna give you one simple example. And so this is, uh, uh, this is a uh, five-year pattern uh, for, for omega is equal to 60. So my domain omega is, is the local omega stands for frequency. So the capital omega stands for the domain. This is a, a unit box with 80 by 80 samples. So this is the ground truth right here, okay. And uh, we are sampling our unit circle with about 80 by 80 points, 80 points for R uh, receiver, 80 points for source. So actually they're identical set. And uh, now, I mean, the eta is a, is a Gaussian mixture. So this, this is a pretty simple example. So we have a, here you see that the four Gaussians, but you can, you can up, go up to a, a certain number of Gaussians scattered around in the domain. So the training pair that we use for uh, training the inverse problem is about uh, is about 12K. So this is um, much smaller compared to this um, image net data set people use for image classification. It's easily in the millions of uh, hundreds of millions. But for us, um, we, we are interested in the case of the small data. So what we do is that we take the ground truth, we solve the Hamilton's equation to figure out the far field pattern. So this is the far field pattern. So the DRS, this is a true DRS, okay? And then from the true DRS, what we do is that we train the neural network. And then once the neural network is trained, we feed into this DRS, is my boundary measurement, five field measurement. And I'm trying to figure out what the neural network spit out. So this is one neural network spit out. So then what we do is that we compare this neural network results with the ground truth and see what kind of accuracy do we get. So you see that visually that they're almost indistinguishable, or they're very close to each other. So in fact, what we get to the inverse map in this case is about 1% error. So we also did the neural network for the forward map. So this is not the linearized forward map I, I, I was talking about. This is actually the nonlinear forward map. You can also use neural network to represent that. And for that, we get about 4% of accuracy. So the second example I want to talk about is electric impedance tomography. So in this case, uh, the setup is also pretty simple. So, so you have a domain. Uh, so we assume that on the left and the right, these sides are pure periodized. So, uh, so, so this is a really uh, simple <coughs> elliptic type of, well, I mean, it's not always elliptic, but it means, so it's, 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 you can say it's a shorting type of uh, equation. So you have a minus Laplacian plus an eta, which is unknown uh, potential, okay? Now, uh, 
so the, the potential itself is unknown. Now, now what, what you do is that, uh, but what you can, so the goal is to figure out what is eta. So what is our, how do we get our boundary measurement? Well, the way we do boundary measurement is the following, is that, uh, so in, on the left picture, we assume that we only do boundary measurement on the top face. On the right picture, we assume that we do boundary measurement on both the top and bottom. Okay, let's use the right picture for this as an example. So what you do in order to get the boundary measurement, what you do is that for every point, for every point boundary point S, what you can do is you can put a delta source at the point. So in some sense, what you do is that you specify the boundary condition, which is equal to delta at point S and zero everywhere else. Okay, in the ideal, idealized case. And then what you can do is that you can, this is my derivative boundary condition. Then what you can do is that you can solve this, uh, the problem and figure out what is the normal derivative. So the normal derivative is denoted by this, right? So the superscript S stands for, uh, to, is really to pinpoint to where did I put the source because I'm gonna put the source at all the boundary point. So I have to have an index to denote that. So if you bound, measure the normal derivative at all the boundary point R, so not only at the one point S, I, I'm gonna take the boundary measurement at all points R, okay? So, this is my Neumann data, okay? So if I go through all the possible S and record the normal derivative at all the possible R, and this will again give me a 2D array. So this is my Dirichlet to Neumann map, okay? So the inverse problem is really to take the Dirichlet to Neumann map, okay, for all R and S and try to figure out what is eta. So this is my inverse problem in this very simple setting. So again, we do the same kind of analysis. Uh, we were trying to study what happened to the forward map because I need to understand the forward map so that I can, I can do uh, this uh, filter back projection. So for the forward map, after you do half page calculus, um, uh, you, what you see is that, well, this, this, this boundary measurement is actually also depends on the internal media perturbation through this operator. This is really the product, pointwise product of two, uh, 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 a gradient of the uh, Green's function, where the Green's function is for the for for, for the problem with, with eta equal to zero. Okay, so th this is the Green's function of the problem when there's no media perturbation. Now, this is already fairly simple uh, 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 formula, but to make it more friendly to neural network, what we're going to do is that we're going to do a very simple uh, coordinate transformation. So recall we have this R and S. So R is going to be S. S may source point maybe here the R is my receiver point. But, but instead of just working with R and S, I'm gonna do a coordinate transformation. I'm gonna reshuffle my data in terms of the middle point M and also the half width, which is R minus S, which is called H, okay? So essentially, I'm, what I'm going to doing is I'm gonna reshuffle my data to reparameterize my data in a slightly different coordinates. So the advantage of this is that in this new coordinate, if I'm gonna write my data in this new coordinate, so this is a trick that people often used in the seismic imaging because this is, uh, 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 there's a terminology for that that we're not going to, but essentially is that by, by reshuffle re, re the data, I mean, it's many of the migration techniques becomes much easier. <coughs> okay, so, uh, so yeah, okay. So, but if you do redo this parameterization, you see that this kernel itself can be written this way. So here I'm, I'm, I'm hiding this, H and Z index, I'm moving them to the, uh, to, to the uh, uh, upper index here. But the point I want to point out is that if you fix H, you freeze H and you freeze Z, then what you take a look at this operator, this is really a convolution operator in the M and the X domain. So that's what I'm written down here. This is 1D convolution in M and the X with H and the Z as the channels. Okay, so, so, so this is just a 1D convolution. Now, in fact, that this convolution can be also simplified uh, in the sense that you don't really need to keep all the H and all the Z because the problem itself is, 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 is really coming from elliptic equation. So therefore, there's a smoothing effect here. So, 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 so the Z, which, mean, which means the depth, how much it, so, 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 so in fact, you can see that you don't really need too many points in Z because the, the Green's function decays and become more smooth when moved away from the singularity. And for the same reason that you don't need to, to put too many degree freedom in H. So therefore there's a lot of compression you can do for H and Z in H implementation, but this is quite detailed, okay? Now, so, but the main point is that 
and this this is this linear forward operator itself is really just a bunch of 1D convolutions. And similarly, uh, the A star is also the adjoint operator can also be represented by a bunch of 1D convolutions. And we, in, in practice, we just use CNN for that. Okay. Now the neural network architecture is actually um, is, is again is is, is 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 very similar from the previous example. We we do filter back projection. So by now we know that this itself is a uh, even though this is is what I mean this this this, this is a quite complicated operator. But by doing this. Uh, introduce this M edge midpoint and offset coordinates, we can actually try to represent it as a 1D convolution. Okay, a bunch of 1D convolutions. And this operator itself is still pseudo differential operator. So that we try to represent this with our VCR net. So therefore the whole architecture roughly looks like, I reshuffle my data. So my data is used to be an RS coordinate, but I have to pre-process -pre it, I reshuffle it. I make it into the middle point and offset coordinate. And then after some modulus, some compression and decompression, let's not worry about it. So what I'm doing here is that the first step is just to apply A star. This is performed by using 1D CNN. Then I'm performing this inverse operator. This is done by using the BCR net. And uh, then after that, I get my result. Okay, so this is the same similar architecture, but just that this component would used to be the switch net, but now I can just use 1D CNN by using this translation variant phenomena of my problem. So this is the result that we get. And here we, we measure the, we, 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 the RNS could be either on the top face or on the bottom face. So uh, we have about 8,000 training points. So this is quite small compared to all these neural network applications in language and as image classification. So this is where we start from. This is Guan Chu's. So this is my ETA. So I don't know this. But but um, but I mean, a neural network doesn't know that, right? But when I prepare the testing data, I take this eta, I use this to figure out what the DRS. Here, the DRS has four components because R and S could either be on the top surface or at the bottom surface. So that's that's why you have four images, and this is in the D and M H coordinate where it's already shifted. Now then, we use a neural network to do the reconstruction, and this is the eta tilde, this neural network construction. And you can see that these two pictures are actually very similar to each other. So in fact, if you take a look at the error, this is about 8%. Okay. All right, so in the remaining uh, few minutes, I mean, I'll just quickly go through this application the travel time tomography. So here, the equation that governs this, uh, the physics here is the so-called Icono equation. It's a Hamilton Jacobi equation. So in the first example, it's a wave equation. The second example is more like elliptic equation. And here is Hamilton Jacobi equation. So, uh, so the unknown is that uh, you can think about this as a, a 2D case where the unknown material property is living in the circle. And, uh, and, uh, and the, what we're trying to figure out is this M theta here, which is the media perturbation from the constant background. And how do we get the data? The way we get the data is that for every source point S, this is my source point, what I'm doing is that I'm trying to solve the high corner equation. Well, I mean, the nature solves it, okay? So the, the Icona equation is solved. And then for every boundary point, you record what is the solution of the Icona equation. So for example, this is my receiver point. So this USR is actually the minimal distance between minimal travel time between minimal, sorry, minimal let me just, not minimal travel time between the point R and S, okay, under this medium. So you do that for all source points and you do that for all receiver points. As so once you do that, you have this 2D array, okay? So the job is to take this complete travel time information of my boundary points and try to figure out what is the interior property. All right, again, we do the same thing. We take a look at what happened to the forward analysis. So the forward map is from M theta, which is my media perturbation to my travel time data. And, uh, and, and again, we do the same thing is that we, we do a, a coordinate transformation. Suppose this is my receiver, this is my source, okay? So my data are represented in RS coordinates. But, but my coordinate transformation is a rewrite the R in terms of S plus H. So H is this angle that you rotated going from S to R. And by doing that, I can rewrite my data in terms of this S and shift coordinates. The good thing is, is that if you take a look at these new coordinates, the linearized forward map is again a convolution. Because if you freeze edge and you freeze row, so row corresponding to the polar coordinates. Okay, so this is my row, this is my theta. 
So if you freeze edge and freeze row, and so these things are gonna be freezed. So what you have left is that you see that the DS is actually a convolution of the MTO time in the SD that domain, right? So this again becomes a windy convolution. So this is shows you the powerful, uh, this power of the pre-processing because my, my, the lesson I learned is that when you do neural networks, uh, when you do a careful pre-processing of your data, especially in those PDE case, can dramatically simplify the architecture of the neural network and make the training much simpler. So I'll more or less skip the rest of the discussion because it's exactly the same here. It's, it's actually it's exactly the same slides that I had earlier for this EIT case, because again, you'd use 1D convolution, you use VCR. So I just want to show you the result, okay? So uh, again, so this is my domain, and uh, I'm going from trying to use D, which is a boundary measurement, and to figure out my M time and the X uh, in, for X inside the domain. Okay, so I'm using 20,000 uh, training pairs uh, and for training and also for testing. So here's give you a typical results. So this is the reference. This is the, the data we use to generate the boundary measurement. So this is a true MTO time, okay? And now we tried MTO time and, and there's three different categories, three different tests we did. Either we only include the negative inclusions where MTO time is less than zero, or positive inclusions where MTO time is greater than zero, or the mixed inclusions, MTO time could be either positive or MTO time could be negative. Right here, the yellow stands for negative, the, the, the Dark blue stands for the positive, and the last one has both positive and negative. Okay. Now here is, is that we don't add any noise to the data we receive. So the D is exact. Okay, we use exact trouble time data and try to figure out the M theta. You see that the reconstruction is almost exactly the same as the reference. Okay. Now we add the 2% of noise, we do the 2D. So D is plus 2% of noise. That's what we did for this column. So you see the reconstruction is also very good. So it's sometimes a little bit blurry, but that's but again, it's, it's pretty decent. So we, 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 we push up the noise all the way to 10%. You see that when, when things become more blurry, blurry, but again, we capture the location, capture the orientation. So, so the, the, the result is fairly decent. Okay, so I'm, uh, I'm, uh, I guess, uh, hopefully, uh, can, I, can I have one more minute to summarize? Yeah, sure. Go ahead. Yeah, yeah. Okay. So, so I, so I talk about in this talk I talk about uh, two components. The first, I introduce some new modules, and these modules for pseudo differential operator and full integral operator, and these are really uh, designed to to represent these these two neural networks. These are designed to represent pseudo and uh, differential operator and also full integral operator, which are very important uh, objects in inverse problems. And I also talk about three applications. So the takeaway message is that in our approach, we, we use the mathematics and physics and the plus some simple, the really simple mathematics and physics to motivate the architecture of the neural network. So we didn't just take, I mean, the neural network that other people designed for imaging, uh, for, for, sorry, for image classification, for, for many other tasks. We really designed the neural network based on the mathematics and physics of the problem. And then we use the data to, 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 to train for the weights. So this way, we not only we get the model, meaning mass and physics, but we also get the data prior. So that's that, that's why I think that our approach gives a pretty decent results. And also, I mean, the way we do that, we use this so-called uh, engineering uh, approach for modularized reconstruction. We partition the big problem into different components. For every component, we just plug in what it is supposed to be, right? For the pseudos, we plug in VCR net. For the FIOs, we plug switch net. So, and then we do the end to end training. So, I think these three components are very important. And these are the essentially empirical lessons that we learned. That we, we don't have theorem for them because these are really kind of empirical. But, these, but I think these are the important lessons we learned and hopefully will be useful for you if you, you try to use neural network for similar problems. So, finally, I will uh, just thank you for your attention. And this is supported by NSF and DOE. And these are the few references. Uh, thank you. Great, thanks a lot for a, for a very interesting talk, Lei Xing. Thank you. Uh, so, so now if uh, we, the floor is open for questions, so please uh, please unmute yourself uh, and ask questions if you, if you have questions for Lei Xing. Uh, hi, may I ask a question? Yeah, uh, sure, sure. Here is, here is Mikhail. Um, somewhere early in your presentation, you said that the cases that you are considering are not uh, 
similar to classification of optical images in that they are not over parameterized. Um, uh, right. If, if I am wrong. Uh, no, 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 you are not. I mean, uh, so what I'm. So can you elaborate on it in particular? Uh, does the uh, number of weights in your model somehow uh, suggest you uh, the number of uh, data points or samples that you have to generate to train your network? Uh, thank you. Yeah. So, so whatever. Uh, okay. So, so I mean, okay. So, if if you uh, if so, in the deep learning theory, right? I mean, there's uh, this this there's this belief or this uh, people's um, I won't say consensus, but but it's people think that um, by making the neural network wider or deeper, or by putting more degree of freedoms, more, by adding more weights, uh, I mean, in fact, you will not overfit the uh, the data. So I mean, by because there's a there's a word called uh, implicit regularization, meaning that when you train the neural network in a certain way, like a gradient descent, so the the training algorithm will actually find the solution which actually can potentially generalize well. Okay, so 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 uh, I here we are trying to avoid that because I, I think that's is not necessarily true, and. Uh, uh, so what we we're doing here is that we're not taking this wide or deep neural network approach. We design our neural network to be fairly simple. So if you if we count the number of weights, meaning the how many parameters you put into the neural network, uh, in many of the neural network I showed here, we only have tens of thousands or maybe a few hundred thousand degree neural network parameters. So this is much smaller than I mean tens of millions of even hundreds of a million parameters uh, people use for image classification or for translation language models. So we, we're not in this so-called over parameterization regime, we're in this under parameterization regime. So in some sense, I'm still using the simplicity of the neural network architecture to provide some regularization on my training process. Because um, the, I, I personally have some doubts about this uh, over parameterization give you generalization kind of uh, uh, principle because because we, we all know that in neural network there's also another field called adversarial training meaning that you can perturb your data a little bit and you get a totally different result so it, to me that this is an indication that so uh, wider than neural network even when you train it and give you good uh, training or even testing result is is not really an indication that this this neural network generalizes. So this is something that I try to avoid. So that's why we decide to go the other way. We try to design very parsimonious, very simple networks by by using the physics ideas. Yeah, thank you. Thank you once again. Mm -hmm. Hey, Lesheng. Hey, hey. Hey, Jinlang. Hey, Jinlang, hey, how are you? Um, yeah. Okay, you know, for your travel time to Mugwafi, um, you take the background speed to be constant. If you have a more complicated uh, sound speed, how do you, this, uh, your network will, will generalize? Yeah, um, good. Uh, I, I, we haven't tried, uh, I have to check with my postdoc, what is the most recent thing uh, he did. Um, so in this case, I mean, in other cases, we try the variable coefficient as a as smooth variable coefficient as the background velocity. But in the travel time tomography, I think you're right. In this case, we only try the constant variable as a background velocity. So certainly worth trying. I mean, this isn't a test that we should do, but we haven't done it yet. Okay. okay. Uh, one thing I want to point out is that the, mm -hmm. the, the data that we have here is actually, uh, uh, for example, if you take a look at here, these the, even the media is con background is constant, but these perturbations are not small. So, mm -hmm. I mean, if I remember correctly, that uh, the background of the green part is one, and the yellow part is more like 0 0.5, and uh, the black part is of order one, it's like a two or three. So these are really big inclusions with sharp interfaces. Mm -hmm. Okay, very good, thanks. Thank you. Uh, 
Hi, this is Margaret. I'm, I'm wondering Hi, more about your uh, training. I, I was thinking that you know, for some of these problems, it's, it still seems as if thousands of training examples it still seems like a lot. So did you take, for example, points, uh, you know, sources on, on all the possible locations on the boundary and then all possible locations in the interior? And then, uh, I mean, that, how do you get to so many thousands of training samples? <laughs> okay. Yeah. You're right, right. Okay, so I agree with you that. Uh, uh, let, 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 let me put. Let me, let me first clarify a little bit. So, by t for example, here by twenty thousand k, okay, what I mean by is that uh, I, I, so every training sample. What I mean here is that uh, is one domain with certain inclusions, which somehow randomly generated, and uh, this is my m one. Let's say okay, m tilde one, and also that I have d one, which is r s which is corresponding to the travel time information, travel time information, mm -hmm. okay? So this is my one data point. And then I repeat it, I, I generate, for example, this media 20,000 K times, and this 20,000 K pairs is my training data. I use this to my train my neural network. Now, mm -hmm. I agree with you that the 20,000 K is a little bit, I mean, for certain applications already quite a lot. Uh, my answer is, uh, following that in, in fact in our test we can we can even train for many for some for, i don't remember whether for this application or not but certainly for i think for far fewer pattern we can actually get away with even 1000 2000 pairs rather than say 20000 so so obviously the performance would degrade a little bit but mm -hmm. still usable okay so in some mm -hmm. sense we don't really need a 20000 now the other question you have i mean even you can argue that 1000 is too much i agree with you in many cases 1000 is too much but, but for this data approach, I guess, if we want to capture the data prior, for example, uh, I, I th because the data is high dimension. So, 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 I mean, we can try to push down to say whether we can do the same thing with 20 data points, but then that would be, that might not be enough to capture the data prior because this whole approach that we're having here, because the inverse problem is always, many of them are your post, right? The reason why we can, for example, you can give me two media perturbation was, was giving me almost exactly the same uh, boundary data. But how, then you ask a question that how, if you give me this boundary data, how should I go back? Should I go back to this one or this one? I mean, the only hope that I can find the right one is from the data prior. Because if your data is all around this point, then I can say we should go back here. So we really need to capture the data prior to a certain extent. So that's why we need at least a few thousand points. Okay. Now, the other thing you mentioned is that complete data that's also important. So we, we do use the complete data. So here our DRS is actually with all the points on the boundary, right? So let me, uh, my pen's dying. Okay, so this DRS is all the points on the boundary. So what we are thinking now is how do we do with the partial data? So that's also another direction. Mm -hmm. Thanks. Yeah. Sure. Okay, I got a question. Okay. Uh, oh, yeah. Hey. So if, if you go back, if you can go back to the scattering uh, example. Yes. I'm in the middle. Uh, so this is basically a Fourier transform, right? Fourier transform. Uh, oh, oh, yeah, right. The, in this one, right? Yeah. Okay. Uh, this is not exactly Fourier transform because, yeah, this is, I, I, sorry, I did. Because this S is on the circle, R is on the circle. So, yeah, okay. it's, uh, yeah, but if you uh, vary them, it's kind of for a transform with some restricted uh, set of variables. Yeah, it's, 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 you can say it's, it's a non uniform Fourier transform on a certain okay. shared grid, yes. The point that uh, if you say that we have, uh, I don't see it here, but 80 by 80 points, is that what you said? Right, S is a sample, that, so S is 80 points. R is 80 points on the circle. But right? then you can just look at the matrix of this map, right? With a six thousand something uh, experiment, right? The, yeah, this matrix D. Um, right, sure, sure. This this, this matrix is about uh, six four thousand by sixty four thousand. Yes. So, but but you see, so uh, uh, so I'm trying, right? But but in general, uh, if you just plug in a linear map, this wouldn't work very well. The, the reason is because, I mean, this is something that we cannot prove, but. Um, you have to give the neural network a little bit non allow it to some power to adapt to the data in order to give a good performance. But here I'm just using the simplest case to motivate what kind of architecture I should use for this for this part of the neural network. 
Uh, okay, so can can you go to the travel time tomography? Yeah. Problem. I mean, the linearization is known to be the radon transform. Why do we get this uh, kind of? Uh, no, right, the linearization is radon transform, but but if you just use radon transform, use a linear construction with a constant background of the data, uh, we I mean we we'll try that. You do not get these clean images, right? You will get these boundary get smeared into different directions, right? You can have these but, but like overlay that the, like texture. But the is the radon transform. So, so is that what is the radon transform? This is what the linearization is, it is the radon transform, so we cannot change that. This is no, this is no, no. I mean, if the CT, it is a radon transform, but the travel time tomography, it's not, right? Because the ray can bend. Well, it is, and we have to parameterize it properly, but it is. Maybe it's a generalized radon transform, but is that? I mean, if you generalize near a constant speed, okay. Uh, so it's not really this type of convolution. Well, it's... Although it's easy to understand because the travel time will depend uh, more or less what happens in the small perturbation, what happens along the ray. So it should have some local behavior. But it's known to be X ray transform. Right, I mean, the, if you linearize this around the constant background, it is known to be an X ray transform. So what I'm saying here is I'm not claiming that the analysis that we're doing here is anything, uh, I mean, new. I mean, what I'm saying is that the point I want to make here is that by doing this uh, coordinate transformation, I can rewrite this in a 1D um, circular convolution, then this is much easier to implement for neural networks, and which allows you have, essentially you reduce this to be a bunch of 1D convolutions. So it makes the training and also network design very easier. Okay, if you go back to the Calderon's problem or EAT, I mean, that uh, operator there is actually smoothing. Uh, this operator does have smoothing effect. Yes, I agree. No, yes. but it, it is smoothing. Is it, 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 I mean, it is a smoothing it's operator. It's yeah. a FO indeed, but it's a trivial FO, so it's smoothing. Does it Sorry, smoothing? it's a trivial, I can't hear you. Sorry, it's a trivial what? It's a smoothing FO, so it's a, it's an FO, okay. But it's a smoothing, so it sends all functions supported inside, strictly inside to smooth functions. So. Why do you want to treat it as an FAO? No, I'm not, this, no, I'm not saying this. No, no, for this one, I'm not, I, I mean, here I'm not claiming this in FIO. I didn't write this in FIO. What I'm saying here is that this is a convolution. For this part, no, I mean, the FIO part, and I'm only claiming the for, for, the, for this one, for the previous example, for the wave equation. Here, I mean, I, I think on the slides, I didn't say that it's a FIO. Oh, okay. I, I say that A is a hidden convolution right here. Oh, okay. Yeah. Any more questions for Alexei? Just a quick question, Lexing. So uh, you, you, you mentioned uh, the error, uh, 1% and 8%. I'm just curious, how, how, how do you actually measure the error in, in the examples? Oh, this is just a relative error to error. Mm -hmm. So I take the reconstruction and the minus the, uh, the, the, the ground truth and then take the L2 norm and divide it by the L2 norm of the ground truth. Okay, yeah. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> And also the uh, also the the number of parameters you choose that that's sort of chosen a priori, right? Or do you learn sort of also uh, that aspect of the architecture? Oh, sorry, can you repeat the question again? I was so, a bit broken. So, so the the number of parameters uh, of the architecture uh, you choose that a priori. Yeah, I choose them. Uh, obviously, we have to do a little bit tuning, right? Because yeah. you add a few channels and that, that, that yeah. So, um, I, I mean, we, in some sense, we didn't choose it a priori. We have to do some tuning, it's like all the neural network. Yeah. Yeah. But the number of channels is not, for example, the, I think the most important thing is the number of the convolution masks, for example, in this example, and also yeah. the, uh, the number of channels. I think these, I remember in the paper, the convolution mask is roughly about three by three or five by five. And the number of channels is also roughly about five to ten. 
but then but these are really empirical i mean you just try mm-hmm. starting from the small number to see whenever you get a, a happy result mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. yeah uh can i make uh, one comment maybe not so much question sure uh so uh once again uh uh getting back to the issue of the number of parameters versus the number of data, data points uh so that uh, uh claiming that um or rather uh, uh it may have uh, something to do with the issue of overfitting as well so for example if there is no over parameterization uh it uh, suggests that uh, there will be uh, less overfitting and in that case uh, the networks uh, that are built they will uh, generalize better and it can easily be demonstrated if for example uh, the network is presented uh, a type of image that it has uh, not been trained for for example if the network is trained for disk shaped uh, objects as right. the examples that you have shown and then it is given uh, some elongated objects or i don't know banana shaped objects so yeah. we, we, if it's not if it is not uh, if there is no overfitting this network should perform uh, relatively well on this uh, earlier unseen types of images did you make any experiment on this yes we we did um I, i don't recall whether we did for which example but i mean we have a series of papers in i think it's one of two of these papers we uh, we tried the different shapes for example we train with squares and also circles but in the training data we have triangles of pentagons and they, they can reconstruct and uh, obviously the boundary would be a little bit uh smearing because uh because if all the data is circles, then the neural network will try to think, ah, maybe, I mean, the Pentagon is somewhere close like a circle. But we do, we do have examples uh, where the training data set is one kind, but the, uh, but the testing data is, 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 is a different shapes. Oh yeah, this is really okay. interesting. Okay, yeah. thank you. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Thank you. Okay, so next question. Okay, well, if there are if there are no more questions, um, let's uh, let's thank uh, Lixing once again for a very very interesting talk, um, so, and thank you all for for coming. Thanks everyone for coming, and uh, thank you for the invitation. <laughs>